Amen, amen. Apologize for that. I'm not sure why that glitch just happened, so we apologize. <clears throat> Excuse me, but we are here. To God be the glory. Um, to God be the glory. We are here for a brief Bible study tonight. This is the Real Church of the Desert Cathedral Incorporated headquarters for the House Street Fellowship. I am the senior pastor, the most reverend, Dr. Kenneth K. Booth Jr. Again, I apologize. I saw there was a, a brief glitch. I'm not sure why. Definitely not in our ether. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I apologize. Running late. Uh, we normally have our Bible studies on Wednesday nights. As many of you guys know, we're in the middle of finally going forward with a couple of our projects for the ministry, our location, other things that's coming with that as well to benefit the community. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's taking a lot of your bishop's time, but to God be the glory, we are here. Um, excuse the hat tonight. I did miss the barber today, so I'm going to try to handle that. I am going to handle that before Sunday. So that's the only reason why I have a hat on tonight. I missed the barber. And uh, I have to at least be decent when I come before the people. Um, very busy day today as well. Extremely busy today, uh, day today as well. But I uh, told the Lord I made a commitment at the end of the day, no matter what's going on in the agenda, whether it pertains to the ministry like it has lately or to other business affairs, that I will always make sure I get the word to the people. Amen. That was the commitment, the oath I made to the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to go forward. Amen. Prayerfully, you guys aren't getting any more lag on your end. Um, I'm even thinking about what we say. Let's give me one second. And we're about to move this. Give me one second. Yeah. I think even to be safe, we'll use this screen for the night. Because this one doesn't have any issues. And I'll double check what's going on that before Sunday. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> but we thank God for his goodness and mercy. We thank God that we're here. Amen. Um, I give him all the glory and all the praise. He is doing a wondrous work for the ministry. Um, I cannot wait to give you guys the details of the property situation that we're uh, moving into. Um, we're currently actively getting renovations uh, going. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited. I have no complaints. Yeah, I may be a little tired in my body. Yeah, I may have things I'm trying to catch up on in my schedule. But I am excited about what God is doing in the ministry. I am uh, amazed in such a short time the favor he's given. But someone reminded me, excuse me, someone reminded me the other night something about when time and season meet up and you move into that due season. Yeah, big old shut up. Oh, it's a wondrous experience. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, pray my strength in the Lord as we go forward with this time of study tonight. We're going to get right into the word tonight. I know it's already late. Um, so, we're going to get right into the word um, and go from there. Amen. I pray everyone is well, and everyone's having a blessed week thus far. Um, let me move the screen up just one second. Uh, okay. Um, amen, amen. I pray everyone is indeed well. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Last week, last week. me right now while well, I know what's going on the enemy doesn't want me to get you guys this word but the devil is a lie amen <clears throat> so last week we started a study in the book of Jonah we started a study in the book of Jonah last week and um, we looked at some parts of chapter 4 and 3 and we left off that going back looking at chapter 3 
Um, tonight's word, we're going to do a part two of last week because there were a few keys that we um, kind of brushed over that I need to make sure you guys have a proper understanding of so you so that you can properly uh, apply it to your lives. Um, let me let you know also, um, very, very soon, <clears throat> excuse me, at the direction of the Lord, he dropped it in my spirit the night before last, very soon. We have a mini-series that we're going to cover on Sundays. Um, it's going to be a mini-series on Sunday starting very soon entitled The Currency of Faith. It's going to be a mini-series because the Lord has led me to put together a book tied to the mini-series that will be available to you guys very soon. So um, there will be a mini-series coming very soon, The Currency of Faith. Um, there will be an accompanying book that will be released uh, with that series or as soon as that series is complete. And then there's a book after that uh, a few weeks to a few months later that will be released entitled The Blueprint. Um, both books, the Spirit led me to do and dealing with some stuff to assist you guys in actually applying some principles in your lives so that we can all get the desired results that we are seeking. Amen? <coughs> Excuse me. So let's go forward. Let's go forward. Um, I'm still wondering why I'm seeing some slight glitches. So please forgive me. I'm not sure why that's happening tonight. But the devil is a liar. <clears throat> Amen. So let's get started. Let's get started. This is part two of who do you think you are. Part two of who do you think you are and the overall theme of this part two that goes with part one of last week uh, grace for all grace for all amen uh, <clears throat> tonight's main point <laughs> that we want to look at is to explore and understand the boundless unconditional grace of God <clears throat> as illustrated in the story of Jonah and to recognize that this grace is extended to all people. Uh, let's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, let's take a brief look. Excuse me. Let's take a brief look at our key text for tonight. That key text, if you're taking notes, comes out of Jonah chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. Um, you guys should be familiar with this scripture from last Bible study when we started this uh, teaching. And it is written, John, uh, Jonah prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Amen. <clears throat> Again, remember we covered that scripture last week, and we're going to pick up tonight. I want to give you guys a quote to remember as we go into tonight's brief study as well. It's a quote by Philip Yancey, and the quote says, Grace means there is nothing there is nothing uh, we can do to make God love us more. And grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. Amen. Did you guys catch that? I want to read that quote again by Philip Yancey. Grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. And grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. <clears throat> Amen. So again, good evening, everybody. Um, and again, today we're going to dive into the depths of Jonah chapters 3 and 4 and really get, a, get to grips with the immense 
unconditional grace of God. We'll see that God's grace pours out for everyone all over the world. It's a big, bold truth that can sometimes be challenging to accept. But as Philip Yancey, a respected Christian author, reminds us, grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us more. And grace means there is nothing we can do to make God love us less. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to read some scripture together briefly. Uh, get your Bibles briefly if you don't have them and go to Jonah chapter 3. <clears throat> Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. We read our key verse, but now we're going to read our opening scripture together. Jonah <clears throat> chapter 3. Um. The opening scripture tonight is Jonah chapter 3 through 4. Very quick couple verses. What we're going to do is I'm going to read it in the King James Version first, which I know is the most standard used version till date. And then for the points of emphasis, as I usually do, I'm going to go back and reread it in the ESV version. Amen. But first, we're going to read it in the King James Version together. <clears throat> excuse me again excuse any slow glitches you guys see I'm not sure why that's happening tonight but um it's definitely not on our end I'll say that amen so let's get to our opening scripture and then we'll get into prayer and we'll get into our lesson for tonight and the word of the Lord lets us know according to Jonah 3 through 4 and the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. <clears throat> Verse 8 of chapter 3. <clears throat> but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he has said that he would do unto them and he did it not. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's read that verse again, verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he has said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, y'all. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto, unto Char Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness and re and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take I beseech thee my life from me, for it is better for me to die than live. Then said the Lord, doest thou well to be angry. <clears throat> so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth, and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gar, a gourd, and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. 
But God prepared a worm when the morning arose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And when it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die. And Jonah said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Or another way to say it is, I am greatly angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the ground for the which thou hast not labored, neither made as it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. <clears throat> Amen. That was uh, Jonah 3 through 4, chapters 3 through 4 in the King James Version. And now we're going to reread that for the uh, purposes of simplification and emphasis in the ESV real briefly. Amen. So Jonah 3 through 4 in the ESV reads, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach and, mess and the message that I tell you. Jonah, Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's command. Now, Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day walk. Jonah set out on the first day of his walk in the city and proclaimed in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. And then the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed the fast and dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. When word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, and put on sackcloth, sat and sat in ashes. Then he issued a decree in Nineveh by order of the king and his nobles. No person or animal, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Furthermore, both people and animals must be covered with sackcloth. And everyone must call out earnestly to God. <clears throat> Each must turn from his evil ways and from his wrongdoing. Who knows? God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. God saw their actions, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened them with, and he did not do it. Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, please, Lord, isn't this what I thought while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled towards horses in the first place. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God. Slow to anger, abounded in faithful love and one who relents from sin and disaster. And now, Lord, take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. The Lord asks, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah left the city and found a place east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in his shade to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord had a then the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew over Jonah to provide a shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. Jonah was greatly released. I mean, excuse me, Jonah was greatly pleased with the plant. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and it withered. As the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. Then God asked Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it's right. He replied, I'm angry enough to die. So the Lord said, you cared about the plant which you did not labor over and did not grow. It appeared in the night and perished in the night. But may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 uh, people who cannot distinguish between their right and their left as well as many animals. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray before we move forward. Give you the glory. In the name of Jesus, oh, Heavenly Father God, we thank you for the grace you have extended to us and the grace that is greater than our comprehension as we delve into your word today. 
Open our hearts and our minds to fully receive the depths of your love and your mercy. Help us to truly grasp the concept of your un, of your unconditional, everlasting grace and to respond to it with humility and thanksgiving. And may we always remember that your grace is not just for us, but for all people in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Keep your hand over your people. Continue to bless, continue to protect, continue to provide, continue to elevate, continue to comfort, continue to lead, continue to show your healing, continue to manifest your healing in all areas of your people's lives, all of our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus, continue to use your people as living epistles, walking testimonies to your goodness and your grace that you may continue to be highly lifted up that you may draw all men and women unto yourself. Continue to, uh, uh, to cause us to walk by faith and not by sight. To str- trust in you and to stand on the solid rock of the word of the Lord. We ask you to invade this time together. You're omnipresent. You're here with me. You're there with them. You're omnipotent. You're all powerful. You're almighty. The all-knowing, the alpha and omega. You know the end from the beginning. You knew us when you called us by name. Oh, you've been so good to us, Father. In the name of Jesus, we magnify and glorify your name in the precious name of Jesus. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Uh, Down here in California, we thank God for preserving us through this crazy weather lately. Kept us through the storms, keeping us through earthquakes. I heard there was another today, but he's keeping us. Oh, glory be to God. Amen. Let's move forward. Let's move forward. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Tonight, in part two of a lesson we started last Wednesday, you guys want to make sure you take notes. Please take notes. Amen. Number one, write down God's grace is unconditional. Mm-hmm. God's grace is unconditional. <clears throat> let me guys, let me give you guys a definition real quick. God's grace literally is the unmerited, undeserved, and unearned favor of God. I'm going to say that again. I want you to write that down. God's grace is the unmerited, undeserved, and unearned favor of God. The beauty of God's grace is that it is indeed unconditional. This means that it is not dependent on anything we do or don't do. It is not contingent on our actions, our merits, or our worthiness. It is a free gift given to us by a loving God, irrespective of who we are or what we have done. I say it is a free gift given to us by a loving God, irrespective of who we are or what we may have done. Now, this is a profound truth that is beautifully illustrated in the story of Jonah. Remember, we started here last Wednesday, but tonight we're going deeper. Tonight we're going deeper. This this grace thing is, ooh, she baba Jonah was a prophet who tried to run away from God's command. Let's get that, let's let's keep that in mind, that Jonah was a prophet who tried to run away from God's command. How many of you ministers and pastors and elders and missionaries and prophets of God, apostles of God, um, ever in your life and your journey was guilty of trying away from God's command? I'll admit I was one for for a while. I was 
For years, I knew God's command on my life, his call on my life. For years, I knew it. But I did everything I could to run from it. I knew his command was to go forward and share his word, to share the, the illumination of the revelation of his word that he was constantly giving me. But I tried to run. I ran. It wasn't even no trying. I ran. I'll be your adjutant. I'll help you with the media. I'll hook you up your web and your coding. Anything but. I, I've been there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's move forward. He was indeed disobedient, and yet God pursued him, saved him from the belly of a big fish, and still used him for his divine purpose. Keep in mind Jonah, the prophet who tried to win a race from God's command. And this shows that God's grace is not based on our performance. Even when we are disobedient, his grace. Is still available to us. Oh, ye Somebody ought to say thank you, Jesus, for the grace of the Father. Thank you. <clears throat> Amen. I got to say that again. This is the profound truth that is beautifully illustrated in the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet who tried to run away from God's command. He was disobedient, and yet God pursued him, saved him from the belly of a big fish, and still used him for his divine purpose. This shows, this proves that God's grace indeed is not based on our, our performance. But even when we are disobedient, his grace is still available to us. <laughs> point A, point A, write this down. God's grace is not limited to a select few. We touched on this briefly, this part last week. And God's grace is not limited to a select few. In the story of Jonah, we see God extending his grace to the people of Nineveh, a city known for its wickedness. God could have chosen to destroy them, but instead he sent Jonah to warn them, giving them a chance to repent. How many of you know that scripture that talks about warning comes before destruction? We see it right here and playing out. Again, we see God extending his grace to the people of, uh, of uh, Nineveh, a city known for its wickedness. God could have chosen to destroy them, but instead he sent Jonah to warn them, giving them a chance to repent. This demonstrates the, inclusive, the inclusivity of God's grace. It's available to everyone, regardless of their past, their sins, or their shortcomings. Now, let me put a note here. Pause. When we say this shows the, inclusive, the inclusivity, excuse me, of God's grace, which his grace is all-inclusive. It applies to all, as we see here. Please don't take that lion talking about old Bishop uh, uh, is saying he for, the, for, the, for, the, for this whole inclusion movement from a religious standpoint. I did not, and I am not. I believe there's a heaven and a hell, and this is not a message of inclusion. However, if you're saying that it's inclusive from the standpoint of God's grace, okay. But some of that stuff people are preaching about this doctrine of inclusion, I do not stand nor support that. Let's be clear. Because you know how folk like to clip stuff up, and next thing you know, they have Bishop out there saying something I never said. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for the point of clarification, again, as it, as it applies to God's grace, Yes, it is a fact that um, God's grace, grace is demonstrated here in an inclusive uh, manner, meaning it is available to everyone regardless of their past, their sins, or their shortcomings. Let's move forward. Point B, God's unconditional grace also means that he is always ready to forgive us. 
You're taking notes. Point B, God's unconditional grace also means that he is always ready to forgive us. <clears throat> Excuse me. When the people of Nineveh repented, God relented from a disaster he had planned to bring upon them. This shows and proves that God is not a God of retribution, but a God of redemption. Hallelujah. His grace is greater than our sins. His mercy is bigger than our mistakes. No matter how far we have strayed, his arms are always open wide, ready to welcome us back. Hallelujah. Point C. Point C, write this down if you're taking notes. The unconditional, the unconditional nature of God's grace is a powerful reminder of his immense love for us. The unconditional nature of God's grace is a powerful reminder of his immense love for us. It assures us that we are accept that we are accepted and loved by God just as we are. Not as we should be. It gives us hope that even in our worst moments, God's grace can reach us, transform us, and use us for his glory. Amen. However, Accepting God's unconditional grace can be challenging. <clears throat> like Jonah, we may struggle to understand why God would extend his grace to those who deem unworthy. We may find it hard to accept that God's grace is not earned but freely given. But the more we understand God's grace, the more we realize that it is not about us but about him. It is about his goodness, his mercy, and his unfathomable love for us. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let's go on. Let's go on. Let's move into now where we want to get to tonight that we didn't have a chance to go deeper into last week. Our response to God's grace. Last week in the beginning of tonight, we focused on identifying grace and what it is and how it applies to all. But we need to give some more attention real quick for a moment or two to our response to the grace of God, amen? It is not enough to merely acknowledge God's grace. Let me say that again. It is not merely enough, <clears throat> excuse me, to acknowledge God's grace. We must also respond to it in a way that reflects our understanding and appreciation. Point A, write this down. Firstly, our response to God's grace should be one of humility. Mm -hmm. Our firstly, our firstly, our response to God's grace should be one of humility. Recognizing that we are undeserving of God's grace, yet he lavishes it upon us anyway should lead us to a place of humility. We did not a thing to earn this grace. It is a gift freely given. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. But it indeed is the gift of God, not by works, 
so that no one can boast. This understanding should keep us from pride and self-righteousness and instead foster a spirit of humility within us. Moving forward. B, write this down. Secondly, our response to God's grace should be one of thankfulness. When we truly grasp the magnitude of God's grace, our hearts should overflow with gratitude. We should be like the one leper in Luke 17 who upon realizing he had been healed, returned to Jesus, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. This man recognized the grace he had received and responded with profound thankfulness. As, as the church of God, globally, this is a point I say that we need to work on more than ever. Responding to the grace of God in thanksgiving. Thank you, Father God. I appreciate your grace. Let me respond by giving you all the praise and thanksgiving that is due to you. This also will cause us to give more. Oh, y'all don't want to go there tonight. When you thank God for showing up in your situations out of just his love, his grace, his compassion, it'll cause you to give more. It'll cause you to give more to the kingdom and getting his, his word ex, um, spread out to more further expanded in the land. It'll cause you to sow a seed that we may be a blessing to others. It'll cause you to give to others more, to give up your resources, finances, your time, your talents, your abilities, because you're just so thankful. Lord, I'm just doing this as an offering of thanksgiving. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace. I know I ain't deserve it in my own. I didn't do nothing to deserve it. But out of your compassion and endless, boundless love for me, you imputed more grace and more grace. Remember, every time you wake up, you got a fresh, a fresh filling up of new grace, grace and mercy. For what was, does the word teach us? That his grace and mercies are new when every morning. So every time he wakes up, he wakes you up and allows you to open your eyes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for grace. Thank you. Thank you for your mercy. Amen. 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 We have to learn to respond in thanksgiving. Sometimes we get so stuck on petitions and complaints, we forget about thanksgiving. You've already gave me mercy today. You've given me fresh grace today. I didn't earn it. Even if you missed the mark last night, yesterday morning, you allowed you to wake up this morning with new grace and mercy. Hence, we can try again. Like the just man that, I mean, like the just man that fallen seven times seven, we can try again. And try again and press forward toward the mark. Press forward toward the mark. We are operating under the grace of God. He enables us. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. That's shot time. Let's move forward. Point C. Point C. Thirdly, our response to God's grace should be one of obedience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it should be one of obedience. Understanding God's grace should lead us to a desire to live in a way that pleases him. As the respected theologian J.J. Packer once said, the grace of God is love freely shown towards guilty sinners, contrary to their merit and indeed in defiance of their demerit. Let me read that again. The grace of God is love freely shown towards guilty sinners contrary to their merit and indeed in defiance of their demerit. It is God showing goodness to persons who deserve only severity and have no reason to expect anything but severity. 
Recognizing this should inspire us to live in obedience to God's commands, not out of a sense of duty, but out of love and gratitude for the grace we have received. <clears throat> and lastly, write this down. Our response to God's grace should be one of generosity. There we go again. Just as God has generously lavished his grace upon us, so we should generously extend grace to others. We should be quick to forgive and slow to judge and always ready to show kindness and mercy. As recipients of God's grace, we should be the most gracious people of all. But what happens nowadays? Somebody falls, somebody missed the mark, somebody got it wrong. We're quicker to judge, criticize, tear down, than to extend the grace of God that's been extended to us. Walking around here with our noses stuck up in the air like we've always gotten it right and always done it right. You could have had that collar on for 50 years and still got it wrong in the, down the, uh, in the process. So the way we have to remember, as God generously lavishes us with his grace, unmerited and even demeriting, we got to do the same for others. We got to extend that to others. Right now, wherever you are, say, Lord, forgive me in the name of Jesus. I repent for judging before I extend others your grace. I repent for freely receiving, but not freely giving. And I determine right now in the name of Jesus to do better in Jesus' name. Hey, hallelujah. <coughs> Excuse me. Your response to God's grace should be multifaceted, reflecting humility, thankfulness, obedience, and generosity. As we grow in our understanding of God's grace, that biblical grace, not religious grace, not man's grace, but biblical grace, God's grace, may these qualities increasingly characterize our lives. This leads us into our last point, God's grace for all. God's grace for all. The story of Jonah is a powerful illustration of God's grace extending beyond the boundaries we often place around it. Jonah was a prophet of God again, called to deliver a message of repentance to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, a nation notorious for its cruelty and violence and a sworn enemy of Israel. Jonah's reluctance to go to Nineveh was not just due to fear, but also because he did not believe that the Ninevites deserved God's mercy. Paul's, remember we studied last week. He had a hot, hot issue, a temper, angry with God, because he did not believe they deserved God's mercy. And what are the leading factors that led to Jonah fleeing in the first place? was that he already knew that if the Ninevites sincerely repented, that God indeed would stay indeed would stay his anger and show them compassion and forgiveness. He knew it. Remember, uh, we recently studied dealing with the compassion of God and how we see time and time again through the scriptures from the old to the new, the new to the old, God is what? Slow to anger. Quick in compassion slow to anger, giving, and he gives us time to repent before we face his anger, before we face his judgment. And we see here in the story of Jonah, even when his judgment has already been spoken, if we repent sincerely, he is so gracious and merciful to still extend his grace. Oh, thank God for somebody ought to thank God for his grace. Wherever you are, just say thank you for your grace. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> oh, sometimes we forget some of the places people are in that we judge. We were once there. I don't understand how so many so-called saved folks so easily 
forget their testimonies, downplay their testimonies, erase their testimonies. Oh, but somebody ought to yell out wherever you are, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where will I be? If it had not been for the grace of the master, I'd all be screwed up. If it was not for the compassion of the master. Oh, shout out about Kosa. Let's move on. We're about done tonight. We're about done. Write this down. Write this down. Write this down. No, no, first, first, so again, the story of Jonah is a powerful illustration of God's grace extending beyond the boundaries we often place around it. Jonah was a prophet of God called to deliver a message of repentance to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, a nation notorious for its cruelty and violence, and a sworn enemy of Israel. Jonah's reluctance to go to Nineveh was not just due to fear, but also because he did not believe that the Ninevites deserved God's mercy. You know, it's funny, sometimes we live our lives like we have the right to dictate who and who don't deserve God's mercy. I don't, anyway, let's move forward. Write this down. God's grace is not limited by human standards of deserving or not deserving. I say again, God's grace is not limited by human standards of deserving or not deserving. It is not confined to a particular group or of people, a specific nation, or those who were personally de or those who personally deem worthy. I say again, it is not confined to a particular group of people, a specific nation, or those who we personally deem worthy. God's grace is for all, everyone. It is for the Ninevites, the Assyrians, the Israelites, and it is for us today. It is for the people who love and the people we struggle to love. It is for the people who have hurt us and the people we have hurt. It is for the people who deem to have it all together and the people whose lives are falling apart. <clears throat> Write this down. God had grace for Israel's chief enemy. Note that. God had grace for Israel's chief enemy. In Jonah chapter 3 verse 10, we see that when the Ninevites believed God and repented, God relented from the disaster he had said he would bring upon them. He showed them mercy. This is indeed a powerful demonstration of God's grace for all. <clears throat> God's grace is not something we can earn or deserve, y'all. But it indeed is a gift freely given out of his immense love for us. But Jonah was not happy about this. <clears throat> In Jonah 4, 1 through 2, Jonah became angry and complained to God, essentially saying, I knew you would do this. I knew you would do this. I knew you would show them mercy. Jonah had a very hard time accepting that God's grace was for the Ninevites as well. So this is indeed a challenge for us as well today. Let me tell you, we can easily fall into the trap of thinking that, uh, that God's grace is for us and people like us, but not for those people, whoever those people may be in our lives. For God's grace is not limited by our biases, prejudices, or judgments, hallelujah. God's grace is for all. Next time you quick to backbite somebody instead before you extend them the grace of God, the next time you quick to criticize somebody before you extend them the grace of God, remember the words, hey, what am I doing? God's grace is indeed for all. You got people out here on these platforms nowadays, the last thing they extend in people is God's grace. We quick. We quick to comment, we quick to criticize, we quick to judge. But where is the mercy of God being freely given that she have freely received? 
Mm, help us, Jesus. <laughs> so, yeah, this is a challenge for us as well today in 2023. We can easily fall into the trap of thinking that uh, God's grace is uh, just for us and people like us, but not for those people, whoever those people may be in our lives. You know, there's some people that you don't think they deserve God's grace because they're going to hurt you, upset you, cross you, whatever the case may be. But God's grace is for all. Hallelujah. Um. <clears throat> excuse me um this is not to say that god's grace negates the need for justice or accountability but god's grace does not excuse sin or wrongdoing but god's grace uh excuse me excuse me this is not to say that god's grace negates the need for justice or accountability god's grace does not excuse sin or wrongdoing but god's grace does mean that there is always room for repentance forgiveness and transformation god's grace means that no one is beyond the reach of his love and mercy hallelujah the story of jonah challenges us to expand our understanding of god's grace it invites us to uh, to let go of our limited human perspectives and to embrace god's infinite divine perspective I say it, it, it invites us to let go of our limited human perspectives and to embrace God's infinite divine perspective. It calls us to, 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 to celebrate, not resent, uh, uh, the fact that God's grace indeed is for all, for everybody. Hallelujah. It's shut up. And it encourages us to reflect God's grace in our very own lives by extending grace to others, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when it's painful, even when it hurts. Because God's grace is not just for us. God's grace is for all. As we prepare to close, I want to remind you that God's grace is constant, never ending, all encompassing love that God has for each and every one of us. And it's not just for us, it's for everyone. That's the beauty of God's grace. It's for all people everywhere, regardless of your background, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of how many times you missed the mark, regardless of how, how low you are on the totem pole, regardless of your rich, regardless of your poor, regardless of your it's for everybody everywhere. Hi, 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 hi. Somebody throw their hand up for you and say, thank God for your endless grace. Your limitless grace. Your abounding grace. Let's take the truth with us, y'all, as we go about the rest of our week. Let's remember to extend God's grace to others, just as God extends his grace to us. And let's remember that no matter what we do or don't do, God's love for us remains the same. It's a love that's bigger than we can comprehend. And it's a love that's available to all. It's available to all. Oh, bow your heads. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus. Dear God, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you for loving us more than we can comprehend. Help us, Heavenly Father, to remember your grace in our daily lives. Hallelujah. And to extend that grace to others. And as we go about our week, remind us that your love is not just for us, but for all people everywhere. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. We praise God for that word tonight. Amen. Oh, we had to go deeper in that grace tonight. We had to go deeper <clears throat> into that grace again. This was part two of what we started last week. Um, amen. Amen. I pray that the word blessed everyone. We're going to get time, get ready to share in the Lord's Supper.
please, if you don't have them ready already, gather your communion elements. I want to pray also for someone who may need to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Or maybe you accepted him before, but you fell away. You fell astray. You know, church hurt pushed you back. Family hurt. Decisions in life. Circumstances. Whatever it is. Whether you've never been saved or whether you backslid. I want to pray for both of you tonight. I also want to make sure we keep covered those that are yet awaiting the physical manifestation of the answers of their prayers and petitions before the Lord. We call it done. We call it so. In the name of Jesus. <laughs> Lift up your right hand wherever you are. Stretch your right hand to faith. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for loving me. I repent of all my sins. I renounce Satan in all his ways. I confess and believe that the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. He died. And three days later, later God the Father arose him from the dead. And he is now seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for me. I believe and receive that I now have salvation through grace, through by grace through faith in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, if you said that prayer and you really meant it, whether you've never accepted Christ before or whether you are backslider returning, you are indeed saved. If you meant that in your heart, your name has been entered in the Lamb's Book of Life. Literally, right now, heaven is parting it up for you. For when a soul comes in the kingdom, they rejoice. Heaven rejoices. When a soul, com soul comes back in the kingdom, like a prodigal returning to its father with the table spread wide, they are feasting your return in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Uh, make sure you write us. Let us know if you fill in one of those categories. We want to minister to you, get some information to you that will help strengthen your walk with the Lord. And always, we have to make sure the doors of the church are open. Yes, we're excited that we're getting things renovated. Uh, the renovations began at our pro property. We'll quickly get in there. Um, um, even looking at using a temporary part of the property right now while the rest of it is being renovated. We'll see how that goes. Um, but we, we just thank God for his grace and mercy through the whole process. And allowing us to open the doors of the church. If you need a church home, we welcome you to join with us. We're a church that is focused on keeping it real and serving God uh, 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 as he graces us and gives us the ability. We, we want to just be more like him. We want to do his will. Amen. Amen. Ain't no competitions over here. Ain't no big eyes and little U's over here. We are a family searching the scriptures, searching to be better followers, better disciples of the master. So if you need a church home, a covering, we welcome you to go to the real church of the desert .com. in the right hand corner. You can click join COD Cathedral and we will begin to get you acclimated to the new members process. Amen. Glory be to God. We're thankful for the members we have as that thing continue to grow. We are grateful in the name of Jesus. Before we uh, share a communion and have our benediction, it is time to give. Amen. It is time to sow a seed. We do indeed invite you guys to sow seed here in fertile ground, grounds that God has favored and is moving rapidly to show us his favor. <clears throat> um, as many of you guys know, we are in a very favorable, rare situation with the property and other things we're looking at doing to get to bring God continual glory and to serve you, his people. We strongly believe that we serve God by serving the people of God. So I want to invite you to sow a seed. We thank God for those that have sown their first fruits and tithe and offerings already. We invite you to sow your seed of tithe and offering and first fruits here in a good ground. And those that just want to sow a seed. Hey, hey, I'm sowing a seed into that word I received. I'm sowing a seed of thanksgiving to the Heavenly Father. I'm sowing a seed out of a need. Whatever it is, we invite you to sow in good ground. You see the giving prompts on our screen. The only one that's different is where it says text to give. That should say text C-O-D-C -C, give. 
C O D C Give for text to give. You also can go online. You can download our app off the out app stores. Just put C O D Cathedral and it'll pop right up. You can mail in your gifts. You can also still go on Cash App or Venmo. Dollar sign C O D Cathedral. Dollar sign C O D Cathedral. Amen. So go ahead and get your gifts together. <laughs> I'll give you a second as I do mine as well. You know the bishop drinks his own Kool-Aid, and we'll move on with our, <coughs> excuse me, with our communion. Yes, yes. Go ahead and sow a seed. We're going to say a blessing and move forward. Um, we definitely invite you to do that again. If you're doing Venmo or Cash App, it is dollar sign C-O-D Cathedral, dollar sign C-O-D Cathedral. Also, I was recently asked, I'm not big on it, but I'll throw it out there. There were people asking me, hey, Bishop, if we wanted to do a Taruma to you, if you wanted to sow directly into you, how could we do that? That's simple, cash app, dollar sign, presiding bishop, KKBJR. That is dollar sign, presiding bishop, KKBJR. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for the gifts. We thank you for the givers. We thank you, Father God, for multiplying it back to them, some 60, some 80, even 100-fold, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the uh, for those that are partnering with us and partnering in your word, saying that word was for me. I believe that word. I take you at your word. I want to be an active covenant participant in the expanding of your work, of your kingdom, of your purpose in this earth. We thank you for allowing us to be very fertile ground, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for every testimony that has come in and continues to come in. We thank you for every blessing, every breakthrough, every miracle. For we know that you're just getting started with us. So we thank you for what you've already accomplished in the ministry and in our individual lives. And we thank you for what you're doing now and you're going to continue to do even more so in Jesus' name. We thank you. For more testimonies, the Lord multiplied it in order to the most shot time. That was what was in thine hand, and you released to the Lord out of thanksgiving, out of obedience, whatever it was that the Lord placed on your heart to do. Some, it was tithe and offering. Others, it's I've already tithed and gave an offering, but I understand I should never come empty before the Lord, so I need to sow something into that word, into the moment, into the spirit of God. Thank you for doing it, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We're about to pre prepare to move forward. Uh, let's get here. So we can move forward indeed. <clears throat> I pray that you guys get your community elements ready to go. <clears throat> Please believe, uh, remember, if you have not been water baptized, that was not for you. If you need to be water baptized, please reach out to us via email, DM, however you got to reach us, and we'll get you baptized. I am proud to announce that in our facility, as the renovations are going getting underway, we will be installing a baptismal pool. The pool will always be ready. If we're giving the word, the pool should be ready for those to not just accept Christ, but to go ahead and and uh, become water baptized. So the pool will indeed be, be there and always ready to go, amen? Amen. We're just so grateful and thankful for what he's doing. I mean, the favor with the city, the favor with the sellers, just favor, favor, favor. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> amen. It is written in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23, to be clause through the 25th verse. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and had given thanks and broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. <laughs> Amen. Um, we want to take a few moments briefly of silence because we know that we're not to partake in the celebration of the Eucharist um, with a bitter heart, an unforgiving heart, unforgiving spirit, malice, hatred, anger, 
all of that needs to go by faith in Jesus name so you don't drink and partake damnation on yourself according to the scripture so let's take a brief quick moment right now and ask God to search our heart and if he finds anything that is unlike him ask him to remove it by faith in Jesus name but really mean it because many times we just say stuff and by faith no you gotta mean that thing faith and belief go ooh. Let me, let me, again, let me stop because I'm getting into something we're going to get into very soon as a teaching. But they go together. So you must believe what you're asking that you've received by faith. You must believe that it is so in the name of Jesus. So go ahead, take a moment, <coughs> ask the Lord to search your hearts. <coughs> Excuse me. Amen. Amen. So again, the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and when he break it, when he break it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat ye all together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink ye all together. Amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, there's a lot of great teaching coming up that God has given me for you guys. Um, we're definitely going to do a teaching on making sure we always come before the Lord with something and the significance in that. We have a mini series coming up um, dealing with the currency of faith, a mini series that the Lord has instructed me to come to uh, accompany a book with it. So um, y'all pray my schedule stays busy. But uh, I am about to embark on right, beginning to write the book in the coming days, The Currency of Faith, which will be accompanied with a mini-series we will cover very soon on Sunday morning. Um, there's also a book coming after that entitled The Blueprint. These two projects, the spirit literally dropped on me the other night, which is why otherwise I wouldn't even be worried about it. <laughs> um, so I'm going forward being obedient so that it may bless you God's people, amen? We thank God I'll be at the property tomorrow. Again, we're finally getting underway. Um, we got to do one or two more things, and then renovations will be happening. Um, I have some job positions I'm going to be posting um, in the coming day or two. Those that's in the construction industry, you might be able to get a, a part of this project. Um, in other administrative positions, we need to fully have a fully functioning ministry, not just for the uh, – for the Real Church of the Desert Cathedral, but also for the How To Fellowship, our overarching fellowship, we do have some paid positions about to open up that will assist me, um, your bishop, to have more time, and also to ensure the uh, the fluid functioning of the ministry, whether I'm available or not. Amen. We thank God for our discipleship students. We're about to go into the second book already of four books. God is moving this core group are going to be some of the uh, cathedrals, uh, first missionaries, first ministers, and things like that. And <clears throat> we praise God for that. We'll be with them this Saturday, and then we'll all be together back this Sunday. Amen. Glory be to God. Uh, stretch your right hand of faith up, please. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. 
and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. Now go, now may you go in the grace of the Lord, our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the sweet Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore in the mighty name of Jesus. We do pray and declare and we all said, amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Oh, glory, glory, glory. We thank God for this time of uh, engagement together as we went on with sec uh, the second part of what we started last week. I pray that you got something out of it and that you are um, that you are freely receiving the biblical grace, God's grace, freely in your lives today. Remember that I love you with the love of the Lord. Discipleship students, I'll see you Saturday morning. Everyone else, I will see you Sunday morning on time, bright and early. Um, uh, 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 the Lord said the same. I may go live again from the property tomorrow like I did the other day. But we thank God for what he's done. In, in a few days, I'll give you guys some details on how it came together. And you're going to say that with nothing but the favor of God. Nothing. But we thank God. We're moving forward. We are good. I'm actually going to release the address in a few days for those that want to drive by while things are getting done constructionally. Um, but, yeah, we're moving forward. God is moving. So um, we thank God for each and one of every one of you. We will be back with our regular Bible study next Wednesday, not Thursday. Tonight was a makeup for last night. So we praise God for each of one of you. And please remember that uh, your bishop loves you with the love of the Lord. And there's never a thing that you can ever do to change that. Praise God. I love you all. And you be blessed. You be healed.